Welcome to this live webinar, Human Rights and Business in Myanmar. My name is Michael Gillen, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Discipline of Employment Relations at the University of Western Australia. This live webinar event is proudly hosted and supported by the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre at the University of Sydney. On behalf of the university and the centre, I want to begin with an acknowledgement of country. I am currently in Perth in Wajak Noongar country and the University of Sydney is on Gadigal lands. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to elders, both past, present and emerging. Now the context of this webinar will probably be familiar to many of you who have joined us in the audience today. And that is the context of course, is the military coup uh, staged in February 2021. Uh, 20, and this coup, of course, has profoundly destabilised politics in Myanmar, but also destabilised economic security and well-being in the country. We have seen declining incomes, a doubling of the rate of poverty, and serious difficulties, as noted by the United Nations Development Programme, in citizens gaining access to food, basic services, and social protection. The overall impact on employment has also been disastrous. In 2021 alone, the International Labour Organization reported the loss of an estimated 1.6 million jobs and an 18% decline in total working hours. And of course, we've seen an erosion in human and labour rights in Myanmar and questions raised about the responsibilities of businesses in this situation, especially the responsibility not to be complicit in these violations of rights and freedoms. So what has been the impact of this coup on business transparency in key sectors of the economy, and most especially the rights of workers? And to what extent have businesses behaved responsibly with regard to their commitments to respect human rights in their business operations. Our panelists in this webinar will consider these questions in three very important sectors of the economy of Myanmar, garment manufacturing, mining, and the oil and gas sector. And it is my pleasure now to introduce our three speakers. Kaingza Aung is president of the Industrial Workers Federation of Myanmar the IWFM, and a Central Executive Committee member of the Confederation of Trade Unions of Myanmar, CTUM. Having started as a garment worker at the age of 16, she joined the political movement against the previous military dictatorship. After she was able to return to Myanmar in 2012, she was a key force in helping to grow the free and democratic union movement. After the military coup in 2021, Kaing Zha has been an international advocate representing trade unions and the Myanmar Labour Alliance. Ben Hardman is the Myanmar Policy and Legal Advisor at Earth Rights International. He has worked with Earth Rights International since 2016 and was based in Myanmar until 2020. His work there focused on issues around corporate accountability, primarily supporting communities affected by extractive projects and land rights abuses. Earth Rights has worked on human rights abuses linked to Myanmar's gas projects since the 1990s and has refocused on this work since the coup of 2021. And finally, Clancy Moore is Chief Executive Officer of Transparency International Australia. Clancy brings over 15 years of advocacy and international development experience, including leadership roles with Oxfam, ActionAid, and he previously led the Australian arm of the global anti-corruption coalition, Publish What You Pay. He lived in Myanmar from 2014 to 2017, and he supports Myanmar's diaspora with advocacy and human rights training. Now, before we begin, with the questions for our panelists, we will also have a period of question and answer time at the end of their discussions and presentations. So I would like you, the audience, to post your questions in the Q&A function of this 
webinar. So you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see Q&A there, and that's your opportunity to post questions on the Q&A, which you can post anonymously, or you can also um, you know, uh, indicate your identity if you wish to do so. So let me first turn to Kang Zha Aung and ask a question about the garment manufacturing industry. What were the main human and labor rights concerns in the garment manufacturing industry before the coup? And how has the coup made things worse? Thank you. Um, before the coup in the garment said, uh, um, the, the main thing is that we have a big challenge for the right to freedom association. Because uh, when we talk about workout rights, we should have a right to freedom association. The, the independent and democratic trade union uh, should be formed, uh, should have a right to form the trade union. So uh, before the coup, we, don't, we, we face a big uh, challenges because whenever we organize the, at the factory to form a union, we face a union besting. But before we have a semi-democratic government, before the coup, we have a semi-democratic government, we trade workers and trade union can organize strikes and uh, communicate with the, the brands. When we communicate with the brands, we have member at the factory level, so we can have a, uh, the negotiation, effective and meaningful negotiation at the factory level uh, in the support of the trade union federation in the, the, the brands. But um, uh, after the coup, we cannot mobilize the strike or worker cannot speak up because of the security issue. So because industries are under martial law, the military, uh, soldier present at the industry. So whenever workers speak out, they come to uh, do the factories and the threat the workers. So now right to freedom association is not possible. And, and because, because our right to freedom association is not possible, workers right, no worker rights now. So now we have a, uh, the, the wage exploitation, forced labor, child labor, and uh, harassment on the women, a lot of problem in the factory. Level, factory. And uh, we never have a good walkable dispute resolution mechanism before the coup. But, but after the coup, we cannot organize the strike or no or workers speak out about the worker rights. So there is no mechanism to help the workers. And at the third, uh, lastly, uh, industries are under martial law so that the embryo, they are, they are taking the opportunity of the political situation. So they violate all the worker rights. So we are calling the, the, this embryo coup also. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we have a situation obviously gone from bad before the coup to so much worse in terms of kind of militarization of the industrial zones where garment manufacturing is taking place and, and the inability of, of workers to exercise voice and certainly the inability of trade unions to function in a democratic uh, way and representing the interests of workers. Thank you very much for those um, brief observations. And I can see there's already a question that's popped up, which I'm sure we'll get to later in the session. Let me now ask Ben, uh, what were the main concerns in oil and gas industries in Myanmar before the coup and, the, and there were concerns and how's the coup made things worse? Thank you. Um, yeah, so there's obviously a long history in Myanmar of gas revenues being expropriated by the military. Um, if we look at this historically, in the, in the early 90s, 1992, 1993, when Total and Unical, now Chevron, were signing agreements with the Myanmar, what was then a recognized military government. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur was reporting on 270,000 as uh, they were then termed Muslims of, of Rakhine State, people we'd now uh, recognize as Rohingya, being forced into Bangladesh. 
That was the time when these gas companies were, were entering Myanmar. We then saw in the 2000s billions from, from gas revenues were being used to purchase weapons, such as uh, Russian fighter jets, loans to uh, uh, current companies with links to the military. By 2016, after you know 15 years of gas revenues, two thirds of Myanmar still had no access to electricity and it had the, the highest child mortality rates in, in ASEAN. Um, we saw huge sums of gas revenues disappeared through exchange rate manipulation and through a system known as the other accounts, uh, which were where state-owned enterprises effectively get to keep their profits in offshore accounts. And so the NLD began to assert some control over that from around 2016. Um, by 2019, they issued a directive to abolish the other account system. It's not clear if that happened. Um, but the military even then uh, still had its appointees in charge of to take on enterprises, uh, was uh, extremely uh, untransparent, uh, refused to disclose uh, accounts, full accounts to the Myanmar parliament. Um, and so it was a gradual process where I think Myanmar was trying to take control of, more control of these revenues. Obviously, that's been, been reversed uh, with, with the coup. Uh, we've seen the military hunter undo almost every single NLD reform. Uh, we've already seen cuts to healthcare funding, um, and we can see Myanmar's being pushed back into a long-term energy crisis. But I think there's one fundamental difference, which is that when Total and Chevron went into business in Myanmar, it was with a recognized military government, which while morally reprehensible, it was uh, at least recognized as a government. Now it's not, there is, the military hunter is not recognized as the government. And so what we have now is gas companies like Total, Chevron, POSCO, PTT, choosing to treat the regime as a government. Their contracts are with the government of Myanmar. The state owned enterprises are just government departments. And so what we see is a conscious choice by gas companies to make payments or facilitate payments every month to a military regime that's committing genocide, uh, committing crimes against humanity on a, a regular basis. Uh, gas revenues are perhaps the, the largest single source of revenue. Uh, the EU, when it sanctioned the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, said it was controlled by and generates revenue for the Tamador and is therefore contributing to its capabilities. And if we look at the UN guiding principles, you know, they say questions of complicity may arise when a business enterprise contributes to or is seen as contributing to adverse human rights impacts caused by other parties. Now, we've seen letters leaked from uh, the regime. We've been online specifically asking, what do we do if they don't pay? But they are paying and they're paying every month. And so I think we have a clear case of gas companies to make payments that are uh, complicity in, in the atrocity crimes of the regime. Thank you very much, Ben. So we have a history here of the complete lack of transparency around the use of these revenues historically, but of, you're right, after the coup, it is a different context situation uh, in terms of um, providing these revenues and these payments to this uh, regime, which uh, lacks legitimacy both domestically and of course internationally as well. So let me now ask Clancy with regard to the mining sector, what was the situation before the coup and how has the coup impacted on the mining sector in terms of business governance, transparency and human rights? Great, thank you, Michael. Look. Prior to the coup, the mining oil and gas sector accounted for about 4.7% of GDP. Those estimates are probably um, way less than the actual amount that was flowing to the regime uh, and to the military via state owned enterprises. And the mining sector would have been a percentage of that as well. As, as Ben rightly said, the oil and gas sector has been high, highly lucrative. But we also know that the mining sector um, has also been a, a lucrative source of income for, for the military through those standard enterprises, through corruption. So I think the first main challenge has been a lack of transparency and, and a corruption and almost like, a, you know, the, the source of illicit financial flow is really funding weapons and, and enriching the military regime. For people that don't know, Myanmar is a very resource rich country, uh, high 
quantities of jade in Kachin, uh, rare earths. In fact, Myanmar has the third largest quantities of rare earths, mostly in Kachin and the north of the country. There's also very rich deposits of coal, lead, zinc and silver amongst others as well. So it's a very resource rich country, both in oil and gas, but also in minerals. But prior to the coup, I think a lack of transparency and uh, blatant corruption was, was one key challenge. Um, and just poor governance generally. The country had made some positive steps that signed up to the Extractives Industry Transparency Initiative, which is the sort of gold standard of, of natural resource governance. There was foreign investment flowing in, in particular one very large project known as the Baldwin Mine, had the backing of an Australian company, uh, formerly known as Myanmar Metals, uh, for a very um, extensive lead, zinc and silver project in Shan State as well. Unfortunately, that project was mired in some uh, sort of secrecy and uh, a lack of transparency in terms of the local partners and sort of represented how hard it is or how hard it was for foreign investors to, to do business in Myanmar without getting to bed with the military regime as well. Just looking at that one project in Shan State, we also know that before the coup, there was a lot of conflict and fighting going on between the Tatmator, but also between ethnic armed organisations uh, and also fighting between eth different ethnic groups as well. So just in that one project, the border in mind, there was probably four armed groups often fighting against each other um, and significant conflict. Now in these conflict situations, which I think is the second main kind of challenge around mining in Myanmar, we know that often women and girls bore the brunt of the conflict um, and there's you know, significant reports of violence against women, um, including, you know, sexual assault and, and sex crimes against women, you know, just in Shan State alone. And those, those examples are, are replicated, unfortunately, in Kachin and other areas as well. And then I think the third main challenge before the coup was a lack of human rights frameworks and, and due diligence. Uh, most of the mining that was taking place in Myanmar was with Chinese companies uh, in partnership with state-owned enterprises. A lot of artisanal mining, uh, particularly in Kachin, for jades and rubies. Uh, and then this Australian mining company and other, other Australian mining companies starting to explore and, and start their projects as well. But broadly speaking, a lack of human rights due diligence uh, leading to a lack of human rights policy and consideration for human rights impacts, I think was a major challenge before the coup. And then I guess since the coup, we've seen these three factors corruption, uh, conflict, and the lack of human rights due, due diligence and policy really be turbocharged and increase, I think, in their severity and their damage uh, to local people. So if we look at corruption and the source of revenue, we know that three mines alone, uh, backed by Chinese interests, have provided about $725 million US to the junta um, at the end of last year as well. So that's still happening. It's still a concern. Um, and as Ben pointed out, it really raises the issue of whether these companies are complicit in war crimes that the Tatmadaw is committing against the local population as well. So I think just to summarise, um, three main challenges, corruption, lack of transparency, uh, conflict, and then just general human rights, poor human rights policy due diligence. And since the coup, these three factors have really accentuated and been turbocharged and have had a really devastating impact for the women and men of Myanmar. Thank you, Clancy. Yes, I really like that term turbocharged so we don't pretend that there weren't very serious concerns before the coup but we see this you know, turbocharge uh, situation in terms of the amplification of all those issues again in a different context so let me now return to Kang Za Aung and ask a question again about the garment manufacturing industry but obviously we have a situation where both national trade unions and international trade unions have been campaigning, have been doing advocacy work. What impact has this campaigning, this advocacy had on business decision-making? And I guess in the garment industry, we're thinking here in part about the response of brands, but also what's been the impact on international sanctions policies? Yeah, the the campaign has a lot of impact on the the, the fashion brands uh, because um, we we are showing the evidences 
how what are the violation where it is happening how it is uh, wider how much it is a uh, wider so so this campaign has been affected a lot i will say and also we have um, we communicate a lot with the international medias and the right groups they they also help in the campaign so that now we, the significant uh, report I would like to refer is the EDI report at, at the uh, Trading Initiative. Uh, this uh, the the report on the human rights impact assessment in Myanmar clearly conclude that the human rights due diligence is not possible. And also they, they, they point out a lot how the business are complete, complicit with the military. So for the uh, for the brands, if they want to, the EDI recommend to the brands, if um, they, they find out this uh, fact, human rights due diligence is not possible. So they recommend the brands, if uh, they to review their business relationship in Myanmar. So that for us and uh, what trade union are now doing, we, we are now preparing for the responsible access plan. We are uh, discussing with some brands how the responsible access should be looked like. So, and after that, uh, we have to hear from, ask them, what are your, your plan? Because HMN, Basella, Indidex, Leader, many big brands, they stay, they are staying in Myanmar. They, they don't seem they were quick. But in this uh, circumstances, circumstances, how they can do due diligence? If they say they can stay do, they have to show us the what are the mechanisms they are using. Are these mechanisms, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, are working or not? How, what are the measurements? And then they have to transparently show and discuss with the stakeholder. When we talk about stakeholder, I now see they in is trying to exclude the registered trade union, IWFM, and that the key important uh, partner. They trying to exclude us and they are working, they are saying they are working with stakeholder who are inside, especially with the labor NGOs who were announced as an illegal organization by the military. So, uh, so we need more the transparent discussion. If they keep continue staying, they will face uh, uh, more serious action against them by the international trade unions and the right groups. Thank you very much. So I'm sure there's a lot we can get back to in question time in terms of what you just said, some really interesting, I think, um, and at the point observations about the responses of brands and perhaps how uh, their claims to responsible business exit might be another kind of corporate communication in terms of uh, having a real impact on the ground, but we'll, we'll get back to that in question time. So uh, let me now uh, ask Ben, uh, there's all, again, a lot of advocacy, a lot of campaigning happening, which of course uh, you're involved in. What's the impact so far on decision-making of businesses, uh, international businesses, and also international sanctions policies? So yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is it's been uh, it's, been, it's been substantial impact. I mean, we've seen we've seen companies divest, albeit irresponsibly, um, particularly Total, and we've seen sanctions on the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise uh, Mogi from from the EU. I, I think that's come from a you know huge amount of coordinated work. You've seen protests from inside Myanmar that local activists have, have documented and, and brought to the attention of. Of governments, of companies, of shareholders, uh, you've seen a huge coalition of diaspora Myanmar uh, groups uh, carrying out lobbying and advocacy in the US, uh, in the EU, uh, working together with uh, NGOs and INGOs in places like the US, uh, UK, EU, uh, Korea, um, both highlighting the demands from inside Myanmar. Uh, from the protest movements and also from the national unity government. But I think it's worth taking a, a step back and looking at how the companies have responded to the coup. 
And their priority seems to have been to maintain the status quo, to maintain uh, the flow of gas and the flow of revenues. Uh, perhaps not wanted to set a precedent that political disturbances lead to disruption of revenues. Um, and they've supported that with a, a, a campaign of disinformation effectively. If we look at the issues that they raised, it was things like, you know, we would love to take action, but, and the buts were things like it would harm Thai energy security. Uh, they're often quite careful to say things like, we've been told by the Thai government. Because the reality is, is that companies like Total and Chevron, and obviously PTT, they understand the Thai energy market because they operate in it. And from the outset, for example, Thailand could have replaced its Myanmar gas by importing more LNG. It had the infrastructure to do so. And so it's simply, it was simply a question of, uh, it would have cost the Thai government more money. And so you have these companies saying, you know, we, are, we would like to do more, but we can't because of Thai energy security. And, and that, that, that's flat out disinformation. They also said things like, oh, you know, we'd be replaced by other companies. Uh, but if you look at, at Yadana, for example, one of the gas projects, it's going to ex expire in the next two or three years. It's going to run out of gas, certainly by sort of three or four years' time. And so that makes it a very unattractive commercial proposition. Everyone has said it's exiting, but it can't even find a buyer because there isn't any demand for it. So when gas companies were saying to governments, you know, don't take action, don't put in place sanctions because the Russians will come in. Again, that was disinformation. And so a key part of the work that civil society has done is to research and uh, correct this disinformation, uh, both with governments and also with shareholders. And I think the shareholder press was what probably finally caused Total to exit. I mean, you had one of Total's shareholders say, um, this is a quote, it's clear that Total Energy is indirectly helping finance crimes against humanity in Myanmar. And so we saw gas companies start to leave and we saw sanctions followed. Now, it's, it's been a mixed result. Um, sanctions, we think, have uh, stopped at least some of the gas re revenues, although from a, the, the Sway gas project rather than the Yadana one. Um, Total pulled out, which at least means they're no longer giving legitimacy to the regime. Um, they pulled out in a very irresponsible way, which actually increased the proportion of the revenues that went to the regime, although I mean, perhaps without Total's expertise, the overall amount of gas that's going to come out and the overall profit will have uh, will have hopefully gone down. Um, and I think it is crucial that international companies like this aren't giving legitimacy to the regime. Um, but I think what we can see is a complete failure to respect basic principles of business and human rights, uh, spreading disinformation in order to allow you to continue funding a regime that's committing atrocity crimes is definitely not uh, what was intended when the UN guided principles were set out. Thank you, Ben. Also a lot there I'm sure we can get back to in question time, including this this question about disinformation and also found it interesting, you know, that, that point about a precedent, a possible precedent in terms of uh, the, the um, sort of way in which the, these corporations in many ways haven't responded to the pressures so let me now turn to Clancy. Um, Clancy, in the mining sector, what has been the impact of campaigning and advocacy in terms of international sanctions policies, but also the response of, of businesses in terms of the decisions that they make? Thanks, Michael. I think I'll make two points. Firstly, the role of trade unions, both international, local, and also trade union groups in Australia has been pivotal to the protest movement and pressuring businesses, whether they're garment, oil and gas companies or mining companies. In Australia, the Australian Council of Trade Unions joined with United Broader Feeder and published What You Pay and other groups and signed the first advocacy letter in response to the coup on February 3rd, I think, or February 4th, um, a couple of days after the coup started. And since then, unions have really been at the forefront of campaigns and advocacy working with local unions, including local mining unions, in some of the cases that I've shared in my previous response, to pressure and advocate for a greater respect for human rights um, and really, I guess, shine a light on some of the corporate practices of those companies as well. So I think that role of international solidarity 
working with uh, local groups, whether the diaspora or local civil society is crucial in terms of bringing about change and perhaps a story that hasn't really been told so far in, in, in the recent history of Myanmar's protest movement. But I think it's important to focus on that, on that international solidarity component. Um, these campaigns have also been led and supported by the people of Myanmar themselves, which is also a really important point to make and often been at the forefront through social media or resisting projects on the ground as well. And we've seen over the last sort of you know, year and a half, I guess, increasing examples of direct action or violence against pipelines and even some mining projects um, that have taken place in Myanmar as well. And I guess my second point in response to your question, Mike, would be that in terms of the response from companies, Australian companies in particular, and mining companies, I think it's fair to say they're sitting on the fence. Uh, they've got one foot in, one foot out. Uh, Woodside, who a lot of you know in Australia, um, after lots of pressure, they decided to exit or exit one of their big um, gas projects that was looking very viable and would have resulted in a lot of revenue for the company. But they didn't exit completely. They kind of sat on the fence. They waited to see what would happen. After some more pressure by civil society, trade unions, the people of Myanmar as well, they finally left, I think, at the start of this year as well. Myanmar Metals, another company that we talked about in the previous, previous response, uh, they chose to leave. Um, there's also been a, a complaint put against them around responsible disengagement under the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises as well. Um, we'll never know the real motivations of, of, of corporations and multinationals, um, but judging by their public responses, we know that they've been you know, concerned by the coup and also the operating context and you know, at times a respect for human rights as well. I think what's also really important to note is that there are still a lot of Australian mining companies, uh, whether they're Australian investors, uh, Australian companies registered in Singapore that are still uh, trying to do business with the junta and, and the military regime. Um, you know, there's at least half a dozen or maybe more uh, Australian linked mining companies still operating or trying to set up operations in Myanmar, whether it's gold mining, um, rare earths or critical minerals or even coal. We know that there are some Australian companies sniffing around trying to, trying to make their next fortune as well. So I think just to summarise, the role of local campaigns supported by international movements, including trade unions, has been important and has seen some significant wins. However, companies are still sitting on the fence by and large and kind of waiting to see what happens, particularly some of those smaller, maybe private, probably listed companies. Thanks. Thank you, Clancy. Uh, it's extraordinary to me that there are companies that are considering, you know, going into Myanmar and the current situation in the mining sector. But then I guess these companies follow the resources and that's that's really what drives a lot of their decision-making. But uh, I think the, the spotlight that has shone on their activities is also very important. So within the time that we have, I'm now going to ask our panelists to consider where to from here, what needs to happen in these industries to improve the situation. So I'll first turn to, again, Kang Zha Aung. What steps would you like to see taken in the garment industry to support a restoration of democracy, accountability, and worker rights? Uh, to make sure we have a worker rights and decent, decent work, and then the right to freedom association is implied. We need to remove the military because under the, the leadership, we cannot practice the worker rights or human rights or trade union rights. So that um, uh, we have to put, we have to take a step to have uh, more pressure on the military regime. So for that uh, inside the country, the, our people stay um, defending our rights, even though they are under oppression, but we, the resistance inside is still strong, but the, we need the international support, effective sanction. So that, that's why we are calling for comprehensive economic sanction at the policy level. We are asking the government to, put, uh, to impose sanction on Myanmar, especially the financial sanction. And also we are asking the companies to diverse from Myanmar, including fashion brands. So that uh, we are, why we are asking this? If we allow the international investor companies 
continue operating in Myanmar, how the international government will take sanction or serious uh, affected the support to the democratic movement. Until now in, the, in Myanmar, democratic organization has not got any support from the any governments, NUG or trade unions or women like women or youth. No, no organization are receiving support from the any government. So that um, but the, the military is getting support from the international government through the development aid and the humanitarian aid and the investment. So that's why we need we really need the investor to leave from Myanmar and uh, the Indonesia to take uh, the financial sanction and economic sanction on Myanmar. And we are also calling for the EU Commission to investigate, to start investigation for the withdrawal of everything that ends. If we have more pressure by, combine, by combine, combining inside resistance and international pressure, we can remove the military shortly so that we can hope, we can um, be up again for our people for the better future. Thank you very much. And now uh, I'll ask Ben the same question. Um, what needs to happen to make things better or, or to improve the situation with regard to oil and gas sector? So the main calls come from inside Myanmar, from the national Indian government, from groups like the Blood Money Campaign, a grassroots collective of activists looking at, at gas revenues, continue to be sanctions. And uh, so that would be sanctions on the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise from particularly from the US uh, and on the banks that are associated with those revenue flows. So the Myanmar Foreign and Trade Bank. And also there continues to be calls for companies to divert revenues. I think it's worth looking at a little, looking at an analogy, a comparison. Venezuela uh, had two parties claiming to be the government. Uh, the governments of Maduro and Guaido. The Central Bank of Venezuela had funds in the Bank of England and in Deutsche Bank in, in the UK. And so they had two parties claiming to be the government. So Deutsche Bank uh, said, well, we don't know who to pay. There's two of you. You're both claiming to be the government. Uh, and so they started court proceedings to ask the court to tell them where to put the money. And in the interim, it's been frozen. That has been ever since. Uh, Chevron, previously Total, and IPTT, POSCO, they're making a conscious choice. They have contacts with the government of Myanmar. They're choosing to treat the junta as if it's the government. They don't need to. Chevron's own shareholders called on Chevron to start arbitration in accordance with uh, their contracts with the government of Myanmar to... Uh, ask the arbitrator to inform them who they should be paying these funds to because it's not clear who the government is. Clearly there's very strong reasons why the hunter should never be considered to be a government in Myanmar. Um, but they're just choosing not to do that. that. That needs to change. If they want to comply with their business and human obligations, if they want to end their complicity in atrocity crimes, that they need to start diverting those revenues now. And there's clear provisions under their contracts that allow them to do so. Um, I think just to address things like the staff safety issues, you've seen a lot of uh, interviews in the press, uh, reports from Myanmar groups who've interviewed the workers who've been calling, the workers themselves have been calling for gas companies to do more to, to divert revenues. And effectively what companies are saying is we're being extorted. They're saying an armed gang, this regime, this junta, is forcing us to fund its atrocity crimes because otherwise I'm concerned our staff would be arrested. And I, but that's not an acceptable way to conduct business if you're an international company. It wouldn't work if you were working, if you were funding a drugs gang. It wouldn't work if you were being extorted by a group like ISIS, for example. And so it shouldn't be working in Myanmar. We have what is effectively an armed criminal gang committing atrocities on a, a huge scale. Thank you, Ben. That's a really, I think, a very uh, significant way in which you've put that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in other situations, would companies pay these sort of uh, 
uh, pay these sorts of groups. If we were talking about uh, terrorist groups or uh, criminal gangs, they would not and they could not. So that's a really, uh, I think, very important observation. So Clancy, let me finally turn to you for your observations with regard to the sector you, that you've spoken about today. Uh, what needs to change and what needs to happen? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, look, the, the current situation is that the three major mines that are funding the Myanmar military are joint ventures between Chinese state-owned enterprises and, and the Myanmar military through the Myanmar mining enterprise, a state-owned enterprise as well. So I think international leverage needs to be applied to China and you know, that can come from many different places. But I think the fact that they're controlling the three major mines, they've also got a large stake in the rare earth trade and gems, particularly in Kachin in the north of the country. So I think that would help bring about some change uh, in the mining sector. Now, th there are some standards for Chinese companies doing business and, and, and mining in particular. So using those existing standards that they've got as a kind of advocacy hook and tool, but ultimately international pressure needs to bear down on China. Um, to really enable any change in those contexts as well. And then supporting local unions where it's possible and where it's safe to do so is, is critical in those contexts as well. For Australian mining companies, whether it's uh, Access Asia that's, that's registered in Singapore that, that has a gold mining license um, or Lockery and Precious Resources, which is another company digging around Shan State, I really encourage their owners and investors to follow the lead of Woodside um, and you know, do the right thing. Uh, invest, sorry, divest uh, responsibly, exit responsibly, um, and you know, give up your exploration licenses or at least pause any exploration activities as well. Uh, there's no ethical way to be doing business in Myanmar right now, and any mining activities will be ultimately funding funding the Myanmar military and those crimes of, of atrocity and crimes against humanity as well. And then just lastly, I think the Australian government has a key role to play as well. You know, we know there are many Australian mining companies still, you know, sniffing around trying to make a buck. And if the Australian government introduced sanctions, including on the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, but also those state owned mining enterprises that I've talked about, that would add some significant pressure and hopefully rule out any Australian mining interests doing business in Myanmar as well until democracy is returned and it's safe to invest and it's a better place to do business. Um, I think that's probably, that's probably the response of the Australian government right now. Thanks. Thank you, Clancy. So we now have some time for questions and we've got plenty of questions that are on the Q&A and I don't think we're gonna have time to get to all of them. So we better get into it straight away. Um, so we have a question for Kaing Zah. Um, How do you respond to those who assert that if global brands stop sourcing from Myanmar, hundreds of thousands of people, of workers will be pushed into poverty? Yeah, we we now we are talking about hundreds of thousands of workers will be in poverty. But how about now? We have a 22 million people live in poverty. We have 1.2 million people lost job, and now we have 1.4 million people became display internet display person. So how we can solve all this problem? So that. Um, Okay, uh, we, when we talk about the government said uh, after the uh, some brand left, brand left, the many workers will lose job. For that, we are asking the brands to continue support for the workers. It is we we call responsible exist. They cannot cut the business and run. No, they have a responsible to make sure worker get the compensation and uh, the salary they, they perform and other rights according to the law. And uh, it is not enough. They have to continue support for the worker who will lose job. Be uh, that means we don't need to worry about the workers from the government sector, but we still have a million of people. We should worry. So that's why to solve the, all these problems, we need to change the political system. We need, we need the democratic government. We need to restore, restore the democracy. Thank you. So uh, we also have a question here 
that's for Ben, and that is if PTTEP withdraws from its operations in Myanmar, isn't it likely that China will replace it? And I guess this is a, this is a common point of discussion in the um, uh, mining sector and the oil and gas sector, the question about you know the replacement of exiting companies with uh, Chinese firms. Yeah, so, so PTT is a buyer of the gas. Uh, it's a Thai state-owned enterprise. And then PTTEP, its subsidiary, is the operator of uh, two of Myanmar's four gas products. Um, and so it's best to look at them together. Now, the gas from Myanmar, some goes out to the Shui gas pipeline into China, and the rest goes out to uh, pipelines that meet at the border, so ultimately one pipeline into Thailand. Thailand, PTT, is the only buyer for that gas. There isn't the infrastructure to suddenly start sending it somewhere else. And so if PTT said, well, we can't make these payments because we don't know who the recognized government is and it's going to arbitration, there isn't any other way for that gas to leave Myanmar. And so the options for the regime are turn the gas off, uh, and it risks, for example, in Yadana never being turned on again because it's an old, low pressure uh, gas well. <laughs> or to allow the gas to continue flowing and hope that they get their hands on those revenues at some point in the future. Um, but a, a, a new company is just going to start buying that gas because there's no effort to go apart from through the pipeline in, into, into Thailand. Thank you very much, and Ben. Specifically for Yadana. Uh, it's such an old gas field that uh, it's it's not worth it's not worth taking over. And we can see also in Thailand, Chevron used to be the operator of Thailand's largest gas field. And as the outgoing operator, uh, it caused huge problems for, for PTTEP when it took over by not cooperating because it didn't want to because they were having a dispute over decommissioning costs. And so when an outgoing operator doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, it would be very hard, almost impossible, particularly for an aging complex project like Yadana for a new, oper a new operator to come in. Again, that's an, it's an example of disinformation for gas companies. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I've got another question here that uh, I'll put to actually Clancy and to Kaing uh, in turn. And that is essentially, you know, the uh, argument of international businesses is often that it's better for them to stay in a country like Myanmar and do human rights due diligence. So the question is essentially asking, is there any basis to this argument? And is it even possible to do human rights due diligence in the current situation in Myanmar? So I'll, Clancy, if you could respond to that first, you know, is it possible to do human rights due diligence in this situation? Thanks, Michael. I think looking at the practical examples of the mining sector, the companies that were there and are there, they're not doing it anyway. They're not doing proper human rights due diligence. So it's really a theoretical question. Uh, you could do a good human rights due diligence you know, analysis and framework, but the answer would be pretty clear that you shouldn't be operating. So you know, we welcome companies doing proper human rights due diligence, uh, but I think you know, any revenue that's flowing from operations to the, to the military regime uh, is going to be complicit in those human rights abuses as well. So yeah. I think, I think that's my response. The context is slightly different in the garment sector, so I'd be interested to hear my kinds of reflections as well. And Kang do you think it's possible for human rights due diligence to actually <laughs> take place in this situation? Because that's what brands like to talk about is uh, their due diligence. Yeah. Brands talk about human rights due diligence in uh, many academic organizations, governments, asking the brand to do due diligence. But how they can do due diligence in Myanmar? How they can do due diligence under their dictatorship? Because to have a, to implement the due diligence, human right to due diligence, it is important to have right to freedom association. And then now we don't have a freedom, right to freedom association. The, the no right to the collective bargaining because we are under the threat. The, the industries are under martial law. 
and we don't have a walkable, we never have a walkable dispute resolution mechanism in Myanmar. So how the brand can do so? Okay, if they say so, we have to ask. We have to ask what are the mechanisms they are using to take appropriate action on the violation happening in the SATA. We have to ask that. They, they have to show us. And then if they say they have, a, they have this mechanism, we have to ask them what are the measurements to make sure this mechanism is working. And then um, the brands have to communicate with the stakeholders, trade unions, and uh, they have to show, the, uh, they have to explain the mechanism and the, their measurement, the transparently to the stakeholder. Now they, they cannot do because they don't have it. So that's why I will say it is not enough to ask, ask the brand to do due diligence. We have to ask what are the mechanisms you are doing to do do due diligence in Myanmar. If, if the brand has it, they have to show us. Then we can discuss further if it's possible or not. Thank you very much. So being more transparent about their own due diligence procedures and 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 how they go about that is obviously a a uh, very important point that you're raising there. So I'm going to turn now to a question from Sarah. Uh, and this is a question that I can direct at both Ben and Clancy. Uh, and that is, should the pressure on smaller businesses in the oil and gas and mining industries look different in terms of focus, in terms of which stakeholders are most important when compared to big businesses? In other words, how can they be made to feel more pressure from different stakeholders? So obviously we've got big corporations in these sectors, more visible, bigger targets, perhaps bigger investor pressures. But what about smaller to medium enterprises in uh, oil and gas and mining industries? So uh, uh, Ben, I might ask you to speak to that first and then Clancy to say a few words. I mean, I would say that it would depend on who the investors were in, in those smaller companies to see whether they were susceptible to pressure. Um, and then also just continuing to focus on the larger companies, not least because the larger companies have consistently lobbied against sanctions or lobbied for exemptions to sanctions. And so the most effective way probably to target the smaller companies is to ensure that sanctions are in place. And Clancy, any observations on that? Yeah, sure. Um, look, firstly, smaller and medium enterprises, they have less capacity to do you know, proper human rights due diligence and uh, really often assess the situation as a large corporation would. So that's just important to note that sort of operating uh, challenge that many small enterprises might face in, in comparison to large multinational enterprises. Um, but secondly, a big challenge with the smaller mining companies is actually finding out who ultimately owns them and who the ultimate beneficiaries are as well. So, you know, there are, I think about seven or eight um, Australian linked mining companies still with licenses in Myanmar, but a significant challenge is actually understanding who is the ultimate owner. And that's why it's really important to have things like a, a transparent register or a beneficial ownership register of who ultimately owns or profits from a mining company. And then once you understand that information, uh, you can engage in dialogue, pressure and other campaigns as well. But for a lot of those, smaller companies they're really using offshore jurisdictions like the british virgin islands that might be registered in singapore as a tool to actually cloak their identity and often stay in the shadows and avoid detection which makes it quite hard to engage in any sort of proactive advocacy or dialogue with those individuals or investors who, who own those companies i just wanted to add that for in terms of human rights due diligence obviously it's more complex in some sectors than others but in the oil and gas sector, you know, question one, are we funding atrocity crimes? Yes. Done. <laughs> um, and so you see companies like Chevron and Total uh, telling their investors, oh, we're doing enhanced human rights due diligence. Uh, we've put in place a grievance process. And I don't mention that they also have to be funding atrocity crimes. And so I think human rights due diligence for gas companies is, is very simple. Don't fund atrocity crimes. Thanks, Ben. 
Uh, we've also got lots of questions here to get through, which we won't have time to go through, but a couple of uh, questions for going are. There is a question here about, uh, you know, the arguments around comprehensive trade sanctions as opposed to more targeted sanctions. So uh, I know uh, going are that CTUM and the Myanmar Labor Alliance has supported comprehensive trade sanctions, but other groups are uh, uh, calling for targeted sanctions that uh, directed at military associated conglomerates. So if you could perhaps say a few words on that issue. Yes, um, we trade unions in the 183 organization, including um, including uh, two student union, youth alliance, women alliance, strike committee across the country. We uh, we decided to go for comprehensive economic sanction because we believe that targeted sanction is not enough. Targeted sanction on the individual person or sector, sada like the oil and gas. That's good. We are uh, we are now seeing the campaign against the the campaign on the oil and gas company. Now Dodan left. Dodan has left. I really congratulate for the group doing this, but it is politically big achievement, I will say. But uh, internal revenue, another company took the uh, the the another company jam in. Then uh, the military state having the revenue. Our intention is uh, to cut the financial flow of the military, so that uh, if we can go if we can go. One by one, go many. We can never have done to cut the financial flow of the military. Because as long as the military having the revenue, they can buy more arms and the fuels which the military activities are blind through all these imported fuel in the revenues. So they keep killing people. They are trying to hold the power as much as they can, as long as they can. So that the, if we really want to, to remove the military in short time, we need the comprehensive economic sanction. It, I, I mentioned that strategically, we are asking for sanction on financial transition. We are asking sanction to block the usage of three national banks which mainly collect in the foreign currency. So if we have done the financial sanction, or we, we cut the financial flow because we don't need to worry about why in gas go many paying taxes or any money laundering things. So that's why strategically we are working on the economic sanction. Target sanction is not enough. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we do have some more questions coming in, but we're really out of time now. So I think I'll now uh, finish our webinar at this point. And I know Ben's been uh, answering a few questions on the on the Q and A. So sorry if we didn't have time to get to your questions, but thank you so much for the uh, comments and the questions that you have provided in this webinar, which have been uh, very interesting and I think have provoked really interesting comments and observations from our expert panel. So let me now conclude this webinar by thanking all of you who've attended this event and uh, all of you who are listening in terms of the streaming via social media. Uh, I would really uh, like to thank all three of our panelists for their excellent presentations and uh, very insightful answers to the questions posed by the audience. I would also uh, like to uh, thank very much uh, Professor Michelle Ford and the whole team at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre for supporting this event, for providing us with all of the technical assistance and support to allow this event to take place. So thank you very much for attending this event. And uh, I hope for all of you who have attended that you stay engaged with the issues that have been raised today. Thank you and goodbye.